Guys, welcome to Launch Control Mastermind Series. And this is our fourth event in the series. I'll be starting the live stream in a second. So first of all, this is, this is Catherine and I'll be moderating this event as usual. Uh, here with me, we got, well, two awesome people. So Adrian is, is our strategic account manager and Travis here uh, will tell you about creative financing together with her. So before I, I let Adrian introduce the topic and, and let Travis add uh, to whatever I say about him next, uh, you should you should know why we wanted to bring him on here. So we work with him a lot. He's a great coach. He knows better than anyone else. Uh, Travis is the mastermind behind launch creative financing as well. So Travis, welcome, and I'm super happy to have you here. Um, Adrian, uh, before before you introduce the topic, Travis, did I did I do right by you, or did I miss any facts? Heck yeah! Well, th thanks for having me. I mean, I'm just I'm excited to get to be here. Like, I'm actually I see a couple names that I, I think I might uh, know too. So from like past things or like hanging out with Aaron and whatnot. So. Yeah, guys, I think this is this is going to be fun. I'll kind of wait till Adrian's done, but um, and then I'll kind of intro myself a little bit and then I'll kind of run us through some questions and we'll get to some examples. Thanks, Travis. Welcome again. Thanks for being here and thank you all for joining. Also, if you guys want to switch on your cameras so we can see your faces, that would be great. Ask as many questions as you want in the chat. We're going to have a Q&A, but for that, Adrian, thank you for joining me today as well. Adrian, you there? Yeah, I'm here. So sorry. Give me one second. All right. Can you hear me? All good? Yes. Loud and clear. Fantastic. Yeah. So first of all, hi, everyone. And thank you so much for introducing me. Um, I see so many familiar faces. So majority of you already know who I am. I've been working with most of you throughout the last year. And uh, I already know a lot of you have been asking yourselves, um, like, oh my God. So I have, I've been doing everything right. So I've been implementing all best practices. I've been applying everything they taught me and I still feel like my ROI and deal flow could be bumped up. So while on the other side, I know so many people seeing great numbers and great results. So what is that I'm missing? Is there something I could have done differently? Then you get on a call with a customer success manager and we find numerous hidden deals in your inbox. Um, they're not interested or they're asking for a price too high or the property is under some sort of contract or they have tenants, various different obstacles as reasons why you didn't go through with that specific process. So let me throw some numbers here. Um, at, the per, at the delivery rate of around 90% plus 90%, you will get around 20% off responses from prospects that, let's say, would be interested or not. So what are their replies? Around 90% out of those 20% will say, um, no, not right now, not interested. Um, or they will be rather neutral, like, for instance, saying, mm, how do you get my number? Who's that? Um, how did you know I'm selling? Um, what's your offer? And then proceed ghosting you. Um, so, which leaves you with only around 5% of people who will be interested sort of straight ahead. But out of those 5%, around 80 to 90% of people will ask for a price too high. Or um, they will be dealing with different obstacles as reasons why you didn't go through with them, which leaves you with around 95% of um prospects that you didn't consider a good hit straight ahead at first glance, which is a huge number if you take a look at your, your list. So if we just leave them behind, that would be wasting money and wasting data. So what happens with all those leads that we didn't consider a good hit at first glance? And what happens with all those leads that we do consider a good lead, hot lead, and we did push them from launch control to CRM or cold caller, and um, we didn't have much success reaching out or up and reaching out. So what is happening with all those leads? Are they cooling off? Are we keeping track of um, where they end up? What has been done? What actions have been taken? Uh, because the majority of the value of your account can be lost exactly due to untimely and improper 
uh, CrossFit handoff from your lounge control to your CRM, and even more important, the other way around. So that's why uh, the communication between the team members, uh, keeping track of what has been done is crucial. Uh, in order to retarget all those leads, let's tag them. Let's push them to different baskets so we can actually re-engage with them with a more, let's say, creative solution to their obstacles. Because majority of those people are not selling since they're simply not feeling uh, comfortable with the idea of selling. Why? They are encountering some uncertainties, obstacles, doubts, and they simply don't have answers to their questions. So this is exactly where we have to start being creative with the uh, solutions we come up with, uh, different creative financing solutions. And that's something that Travis can exactly tell us a little bit more about because not only is he the um, creative financing expert, but he is also very close with our launch control family. And uh, he's been a great coach. And he also has um, perspective from uh, very much experience from the user's perspective. He has been achieving great results in two of the most competitive markets out there. So um, I believe everyone can benefit from today's meeting and uh, he will share a little bit of wisdom with us and um, I will let him take over and proceed from here. So Travis, please feel free to go ahead. Travis, thanks Adrian. All right. First of all, cool. Travis, just uh, before, before you proceed, uh, we also wanna hear from, from your perspective in terms of you are the expert. How would you say what's creative finance? Yeah, well, okay. So guys, they called me an expert like a lot of different times in there. I don't, you know, I don't really know how I feel about being called that, but we'll we'll run with that for now. So guys, I'm just, I mean, I'm just a real estate investor. That's it, like the rest of us. But um, my markets are like Georgia and South Carolina. And so I was the fix and flipper and wholesaler. Like I, I did that for four years and now I've been doing creative for uh, four years since then. So I've been in the business for eight years. So I know a little bit, but like not you know, not a lot, not a ton, probably like a lot of the guys on here, they got 20 plus years. So what I'm going to try to do here, like creative finance isn't, isn't hard, but it isn't simple all at the same time. And so what I'm going to start with guys is like, I'm going to answer these questions that the girls are going to ask me. And then I want to get to like some examples and questions, and then some more examples and more questions. So you know, I don't really have the opportunity to like ask you guys like, hey, how many of you does sub two? How many of you do seller finance? What's your experience in notes? So like, I've kind of got to take a guess here. So I'm going to try to add some value like quickly. Then let's get to some examples. I'll give you guys like some negotiations, some marketing tactics and whatnot. And then we'll we'll kind of end it. I'm going to, I booked a like hour here on the side beyond this meeting. The Zoom link is I think the girls have it somewhere. So I'm just going to go in that Zoom link. I'll just be available for like another hour if somebody wants to like BS or like run through some other stuff or you got like examples that you might need help with. So anyway, just trying to do the best I can with, with the time we got here. So what is creative finance? So let's just let's touch on that. It, it Honestly, it means a lot. It can mean a lot of different things. It can mean seller finance, lease options, you know, sub two, rat. It, it means a gamut of different things. But basically, it just means like you don't buy it the traditional way. Like you're not buying it with the bank, you're not buying it with hard money, or you're not buying it with cash. And so, for the purposes of today, we'll say that seller fine. We'll say that creative finance means two things. It means purchasing a home with seller finance, where you simply get the seller to finance you the deal in some creative form. Okay, or we're purchasing it sub two, which I don't know who has experience in here in sub two. But sub purchasing a home subject to just means that we take over that person's, the seller's existing mortgage. That's it. Okay. Yes, there's certain ways that we have to do it. But for the purposes of this call, we're going to talk about seller financing and sub two. Okay. So for those of you that haven't taken over, ever done a sub two, like why do it? So today the interest rates, I don't know, six, seven, honestly, I haven't got a loan in a while, 8%. And so for us, man, I can take over people's debt all day at two, three and 4%. And that's kind of the goal is really just get, get a, get a billion dollars at two or three or 4% and then just wrap it at 10. And then you're the bank and you play the arbitrage game. So 
hopefully that kind of, I'll stop there because I think I answered the girl's question and then we're going to dive in um, a lot further. Adrian, did I address the first one? Absolutely, Travis. Or is Thank that you. Catherine's? Is that yours, <laughs> Catherine? So. Yeah, the blonde is Catherine's or Burnett is Adrian's. <laughs> Let's see, how can seller financing benefit investors is the next question. Thank you, Travis. I mean, it can only benefit you if you like know what to do with it. But um, I, for me, guys, I mean, seller financing, like we buy, I probably buy 80% of my deals uh, with some type of like creative finance. And so I just like to do that because whenever I got in here, like I don't, I still don't have like a ton of my, I'm never going to have enough of my own capital to be able to buy the deals. And so for us, like with seller financing, I'm able to just do like when I'm running PPC or I'm texting, I'm texting at low equity or excuse me, high equity absentee owner. And I was only wholesaling or flipping. Well, I got to buy at 60, 70 cents on the dollar. You know, I never buy above 70%, but like with sub two and seller finance, you know, I'll buy a hundred percent of what it's worth, 90%, 80%. It really doesn't matter because to me, my equity is in the terms. Like there's two ways you get equity. You got price equity, you got term equity. And once you understand like on the creative finance side of things, like we do things way different than like anything on the other end. We use different terms. It's very similar, but like we talk differently. We talk differently to the seller. We just have very different conversations and it's so easy to smoke your competitors whenever you go in and you simply sit on somebody's couch and they've you do the sixth appointment or whatever if you're in a competitive market and you tell people, well, hey, there's two ways I can buy homes. The first is I can, you know, give you X, Y, and Z, which probably the last five wholesalers did too. Or the second way is I can begin making your mortgage payments and I can probably pay you more. They don't even hear the first part. All they hear is I can probably pay you more. And immediately now you, oh my gosh, I got a bumblebee in here. And now the immediately you stick out in that seller's mind and now they're wanting to talk to you. And they're like, well, what does that mean? How does that work? And there's eight common objections that you always get. It's the 80-20 rule here too. You got eight common objections. We've got an FAQ sheet. We build it out every time. And so guys, simply put, like why can seller finance help you? Uh, honestly, I don't really know. It's just easier to do deals. And so for me, like I'm not a uberly like smart guy, but I'm very good at a very specific part of real estate. And so I can give the seller exactly what they want. It's a very simple conversation and we can make a killing on the back end of them. And we're going to go through some of those. Beautiful. Thank you, Travis. And guys, anyone wants to open their mic and, and ask questions already? Cool. Let's see, I see some people taking notes. All right, I'm too early. So Travis, what about the, the dreaded Jew and sale clause or, or Dodd-Frank? Yeah, so if any, if any of you guys have ever heard of like if you're ever wanting to get into sub two and you tell some of your friends or tell some of your investors that are flippers and wholesalers, you'll always hear like, oh, my God, you can't do that to do on sale. You get called on you. And so and you know what? They're right. If you don't know how to do it correctly, you will get popped. And so even some guys that have been in this business, I spoke at Noteworthy this year in front of hundreds of people. And the guy right before me stood up on stage and said, in my 25 years in business, I have never seen one do on sale clause get happened. That was, a, that guy, that was the goofiest thing I've ever heard. I've had it called on me three times. And so they're going to get called on you. You just need to know what to do about it. And so there's ways you can minimize them getting called. And then when they do get called, there's very simple ways to fix it. So that right there just removes the do on sale clause problem. The Dodd-Frank. Right? You can't have more than four 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 mortgages. Uh, you can't create more than four mortgages. Try to, they're trying to stop the 2008 happening. Uh, there's a very simple way to get around that. We use trusts um, and we sell personal property and not real property. And I'm not going to go into depth on what that means. It's a much more like advanced strategy and very effective strategy. Um, but it's just, it works very well for everybody. So I always like addressing that like on these calls, guys, because like, again, you just... It's, it's like whenever you told like your family or somebody you were, or your friends, you're getting into real estate. They're like, oh, that's going to be hard. That's competitive. And all of that, like noise that we always hear. Well, it's the same thing in the creative finance space. People create that noise with the sub two and the do one sale and the Dodd-Frank and they're real. But you just need to know what to do about them. 
Thank you, Travis. And someone asked, will this call be recorded? We are recording. We're also live streaming on Facebook, so you can find the recording in our Facebook group as well. Travis, this was an amazing elaboration. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Uh, but sure. going to, to practical stuff, um, can you show us your, your first example of a wrap? Just okay. tell us about yeah. it. Yeah. So, oh, so guys, a wrap. Travis, go ahead. before you go ahead, I think Marissa had a question. She was raising her hand, and I see Marissa's been doing some creative deals already. Uh, not at all an expert. Please. I will say that. Um, but I had a question, and maybe you're going to get to this. Like, what data points do you see the most creative deals coming from? Yeah, you mean like what list and yeah. stuff to mm -hmm. pull? Yeah. So, so guys, I I use Launch Control, and I simply text. This is the best way. This is the way I've done this for four solid years. It's and there's only getting more and more of these, and you'll know what I'm talking about when I say it. But guys, I very simply, I literally text all pre foreclosures. I do high equity and low equity pre foreclosures in my entire state. What state are you in? Georgia. Georgia. Um, pre foreclosure data is kind of hard to get in our state. I don't know why it's in Oklahoma. Is there any recommendations? Like even going down to the courthouse seems like pulling teeth. Hmm. I got a, do you know, uh, where are you at in Oklahoma? In the city. Okay. Do you know Jimmy Ogle? He, he owns our company. <laughs> yeah. They work together. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. You can get pre foreclosure data then if it's, you work with Jimmy. It's pretty hard. <laughs> Just like... ask him where to get it. He'll get it for you. Well, yeah, but it's so, actually pretty difficult to get here is what I'm trying to say. Well, hell, maybe, honestly, maybe you can't get it then. I, I don't know about Oklahoma, but where I get mine from, Marissa, I get it from uh, Property Radar. I've tested all the platforms. Unless you're going to go down to the courthouse and physically get it, Property Radar has got the best data um, okay. for pre-foreclosures. I don't know about everything else, but they've got really good data for pre-foreclosures. It's only 50, 59 bucks a month. And then I just skip it through launch control. Awesome. Thank you, guys. And also, so, and I do stuff. all equity too, guys. Remember that, like low equity, fine. Um, but I, I don't really care where the equity is. My equity comes in that two or three or four percent uh, debt rate. Got it. Guys, for, for anyone that didn't know that, well, Marissa is a part of Jimmy Ogle's team and they're, well, our dear customers. So our success team and Adrian here in particular has worked closely with this team. I think Marissa can, can very well confirm that. So whenever you guys want to work closely with our success managers to be sharing all up-to-date practices, all the strategy snippets that they get from our super users, from guys like Travis that we work closely with, uh, this is the email where you reach out to. So I'll also send the the lead conversion strategy session link that is a separate one-on-one -on -one session designed to, to, well, do a pretty similar thing to, to what we are discussing right now, but definitely get your SMS engagement optimized. So I'll be posting that link too. Thank you, Marissa. Appreciate that. And well, I think Adrian appreciates you, it even more. Um, however, Travis, can you, can you show some more examples? Bottom line. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll do some I'll do some drawing here. And guys, if you notice that like on because if we're wholesaling and flipping, right, we're not hitting like zero to 30 percent equity. All right. So imagine like now you get a target, everybody else who nobody else is targeting. So on this side of the business, like once you understand tax, title, deed, liens, judgments, all of that stuff, they become your best friends. Guys, judgments like in my state, they fall off after 10 years. And so the idea of them being like reattached, it can happen for sure. It's about kind of like lightning striking, um, unless maybe it's an IRS lien, they might redo that. So imagine like a home being, it's where you're, they owe a hundred grand on it. It's got, and I'm going to draw some examples, but just let me get your mind wrapped around like how good judgments are and like why I love them. And so in liens and whatnot. And so imagine you got a home for, you're buying it for, they owe a hundred thousand bucks on it. And it's worth two hundred thousand. It's got a hundred thousand uh, dollar, uh, some type of judgment on it. So a wholesaler, a flipper, right? They're not going to be able to do a dang thing with that because you have to pay hundred percent of what it's worth. 
And so for me, whenever I hear that, I, we immediately put that home under contract and we're going to purchase it subject to their existing mortgage and we'll take over their judgment. We'll take responsibility for it. You can short judgments all the time. You can call that judgment company and offer them 10 grand. They'll probably take it. Usually we get them at 80, 90% of uh, less than what they're worth. But let's say we didn't. And so then I get the judgment and I see that it's six years old. Awesome. So then when I go owner finance that home, I'm going to put an early prepayment penalty and I'm not going to let them pay it off in under five years. And so then at the five year mark, guys, I immediately gain $100,000 in equity at that on a home that nobody else could have bought and nobody else could touch. And so the reason I'm telling you this is just to like, you know, for those of you that have been in this space, like you get it, you know, it, but like, I'm just wanting to like expand your mind here on like, you know, I'm not, we're not in my space. We're not after like the way we always look at it. And like, and I mean this in the best way to do, cause I was a, I was a recovering wholesaler as well, but wholesalers are the best at what they do and they're the least paid. Okay. It's not true across the board. Okay. It's just my opinion. All right. And so, and I'm going to kind of show you why I feel that way on like certain deals as well. And so let me show you guys an example here. This is one. All right. Let's see how we can do this, guys. Do you need Boom. a screen share? Yeah, screen share. To... Just a moment. I got it. Enable it for you. Okay. Got it. All right. So check this out. I'm going to walk you guys through this example, and then I'm going to pause for questions. Okay. So this is my remarkable tablet. Can you see it? Yep. Can you guys see it? I literally just got this thing. So I really, I don't know how to use it, but I got a good idea how to use it. And so let's kind of go through this. So guys, this address, I don't remember which one this is. Oh, this is Lucky Bridge. So this is a deal. We just closed it last month. I'm going to show you guys the mortgage statement. And then I'm going to show you what I sold it for. I'll show you my personal sale agreement. So you can see the whole thing and get it. And you can kind of like have a practical, like real world example here on what I, I literally just did. So guys, this is a mortgage statement. This is like the only document I ever need to like really be able to do a transaction. Because I just want to know how much they're behind, what it looks like, what's the rate, what's the debt, how's it look? And so there's a few things. I got a highlighter. I'm going to show you what I'm doing here. And so guys, I took over this person's mortgage subject to, I gave him five grand. I think I gave him five grand. I gave him five grand to walk away from the house. So I bought this house for five grand. Okay. Let's make that clear. Bought this house for 5,000 bucks. So check this out. I took over their $97,000 mortgage. It doesn't work. 4.5% interest rate. Okay. And there's two things we care about. I care about principal and interest. I don't care about tax and insurance. My buyer pays for taxes and insurance, right? Because they're buying the home. So they pay tax insurance. So I care about these two numbers right here. Okay. I've got them totaled up on the next page. I think that's around, what is that? That's 552 bucks a month. So guys, see, I bought it for 97, whatever that is, 97, some thousand, gave the guy five grand, 4% interest rate, around 552 bucks a month. So let's do something. All right, cool. Got you guys teed up. So I'm going to buy the house right here. So I'm going to buy it. So my purchase price, 97,000 bucks. Just follow along here, okay? Don't worry about writing anything down. Just get the concept of it and load yourself up with the questions and then ask them. My interest rate, you saw this, it was 4.5. Walk away, which is all I ever talk about with sellers, is walk away. 5,000 bucks. Payment, 552. Okay, so that's how I bought it. I just showed you guys that on the mortgage statement. So let's go back to something. What I sell it for. So here's my purchase and sale agreement. Let's get the highlighter. Remember what I bought it for? That's what I sold it for. Didn't do any work. We don't touch the homes. In the seller financing space, like we have such a high demand of hunt for homes, but we never, we never touch them ever, no matter what, nobody says we never touch them. We immediately clean them out and we list them. And so I got 20K down. So I could do 1500 hard earnest money. Um, I've got some details in here as well, but I'm not really gonna touch on that. I just wanna show you guys a few things. So everybody following with me there? 
bought the home for 97, gave him five grand, sold it for 165. So I got, I got, uh, equity in uh, price and terms on this one. So let's continue. So we're going to sell. So I sold it at 165 grand. Down payment, 20,000. Mortgage, 145. It's actually higher than that, but I'll just do that for simple math. I sell everything at 10% interest. That makes that monthly payment. I don't know if you guys know how to use a mortgage calculator, but if you do, you can check my math here. 10 BI calculator is what I use. 1273. Okay, that's what I sold it for. So what did I make on this deal? So I get paid three ways when I do a deal. I get down payment, note, and cash flow. Okay, what I make on the down payment? Did I make anything? Hopefully. All right. So I gave the seller five grand. Closing costs, I don't know, 1500 bucks. So I paid a little bit there. I got down payment of 20. Let's just call it 15 for easy math. Nope, that's not right. So I made 15 grand. As soon as I bought the deal, I made 15. What's my note equity? This is the future value that we'll collect. It's the difference in these two, right? It's the difference in the two mortgages. It's 48,000 bucks. So when that person sells, refinances, pays off, I get a big old pop there. What's my cash flow? Right there and right there. The difference between those two. Hopefully you guys are following me. That's 721 bucks per month for 30 years that we collect off one house. One house. I'm gonna collect 720 bucks a month off this deal until they pay me off, which at that point I collect 48 grand, which truthfully this grows every single year because you got a 4% rate over here, right? You got a 4% rate over here and a 10% rate over here. So these mortgages do this and they grow over time. Okay, hopefully that makes sense guys, or at least like kind of makes sense around that. So I'm gonna pause right there for questions. So let's kind of, girls, let's kind of open it up and see if anybody's got anything. I'm going to shut my door because I just heard my kids uh, come home and I don't want to mean finding me in the woodshed. So <laughs> try to bring the kids feel free. Um, anyway, guys, yeah. uh, let's let's see if if this made sense. If, if there are any additional questions, uh, we want this to be an open conversation. Definitely. So um, I have a question about the sell side. <clears throat> I think that's where I kind of get the most confused. So like what type of buyer like are you selling this to? Is it like an individual? Is it like, is it almost like a contract for deed? Yeah, so you can do, you can exit it however you want. A contract for deed, um, you can give them a mortgage, you can sell it in trust, you can exit however you'd like. But the buyer is just, it's simply somebody that can't get uh, a mortgage, a home mortgage mm -hmm. themselves. So you're getting the cash flow on their side and then you're just making sure to make that payment for the, the person you bought it from. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I just, I just put my bank account on here. I just put my, you know, our business account. Um, do right you there. typically give your, um, your buyers the option to like pay it off early or. Yeah. Yeah. I do no prepayment penalties on all mine. It's, it's kind of like, once you do this for a while, like it, you're going to have so many people cry at the closing table and it starts to get a lot of meaning. Like, this, most of these people that are buying my home, they're phenomenal people. They've made a mistake, a divorce, got horrible credit. They don't like banks, uh, business owners, so they don't show enough income or they don't have enough W-2 to be able to do it. Your buyer pool is absolutely massive. Like, so if, if anybody doubts that you can't do this, like just one, like, I don't know why you'd ever do, why that, that's your own, that you need to get out of your own head at that point. But like, you should try to go find how many homes are for sale, owner financing in your market. That's a good test because then if you're still doubting it, well, then hopefully you get supply and demand. Uh, what supply and demand does to an economy. So supply dictates what you can demand on it. And so anyway, Marissa, uh, we sell them to 
really anybody that would like to buy a home, I prefer to sell the families because um, most of our homes are bigger. I try to do four twos. Uh, I mean, they all sell, but our buyer pool is just simply somebody who doesn't want to work with a bank or can't work with a bank. And I call it like my seven year to home ownership is what we tell people. Travis, I have a question. Uh, I'm in Texas and I've been doing subject twos for uh, over 10 years. Um, my question is when you do a subject to, uh, I guess the, the purchaser gets his own insurance. How does that work since it's a subject to um, the underlying insurance is also with the, uh, the prior borrowers? Um, I, I guess, is it going to be double insurance on the home or how does that work? If you want to, I mean, I, I don't. So you're doing them, you're doing them in Texas. So what I do, so I've got some, I've got some in Texas. I put the homes inside when I purchase them, I put the homes inside of a trust. And so the name of the trust is equity, equity holding court. And so, and I keep the seller as a beneficiary inside. The, so this is going to get complicated, but like, you're going to understand it because you do them. And so I put it inside of a trust. Equity holding corp is the primary insured and the seller is additional insured. And my buyer, I don't let them get insurance. It's my insurance policy that goes on. Uh, if the buyer doesn't get insurance, um, but then let's say the home burns down, like, I guess, how does that work as far as insurance paying out? Because the title holder is going to be the buyer, right? But um, Yeah, the title holder is going to be the trust. So they pay the trust first and the trustee distributes the funds as necessary. But how, how do you do it today? And let me, I'll try to help you with how you do it. Well, today. I mean, I think, I think, I think that's, uh, we, we came up uh, with situations where when we do uh, essentially like, it almost looks like a wrap, right? Um, but the thing is that with the wrap, you're, you're giving the purchaser title to the property. You're holding the debt. Right, you're just collecting the arbitrage between um, the underlying lien and your current mortgage you gave them. But mm -hmm. a situation we ran into is because there is already a first mortgage on the property, um, they may or may not be aware that you did a, a wrap, right? But uh, all they have on their insurance is the borrower's name on the policy. And I guess that's where the, the confusion will uh, comes up because the new, uh, the home, current homeowner isn't going to be the same as the borrower on the first mortgage. So I, I think when insurance pays out, there's like a, a, an issue. Yeah, they're going to contact, they're going to contact the, uh, so they're going to contact the seller. Like, if that, and like for one, like we're talking about anomaly, right? The house running down. So one in you know, millions, but you know, if the house does burn down, they're going to contact the seller. If you have them as primary. But all you got to do on that is just put yourself as secondary or additional insured at the bottom. Then you'll be contacted as well if the home burns down and then they'll ask for the documentation on like who actually owns the home and who the check should be distributed to. Got it. But it's very important that since we are the, uh, the no holder that we should be the additional insured on the uh, first mortgage policy. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, of course. I'm loving the convo so far. Yeah, is anyone else? Yes? I yeah, do. that was a good question. Um, I also had it, and I just wanted to extend the question a little bit further. Um, so in your example, you did not include like taxes or insurance in there, um, but the, so the, the end buyer's payment is the 1273 plus the taxes and insurance. And is that correct? Correct. Yep. And, and they make you escrow, but you escrow everything. You probably have a third party that, uh, escrow company that, um, that, that takes that. And so they, um, they pay the, the taxes and insurance automatically for you. Yep. Yep. And see this, this underlying one I took over sub two, right? So on that mortgage statement, you got to pay, you got to pay uh, PITI on that. 
So taxes and insurance are already paid by the that underlying escrow company. And then I just pass through the cost to my buyer. That's why okay. when I draw my examples, like I don't include it because it's just a pass through cost. Okay. I see. Yep. Uh, and then my other question is um, maybe if you could go a little bit deeper on when you made, you said that your mortgage is paid down like a lot slower than the underlying mortgage that, that you have on it. It's not an yeah. interest only loan, right? It's amortized. Yes, sir. Yep. So these are both amortized loans. So whenever I bought, let's say on this buy side, right? So on this buy side, like this home loan is probably, it's probably 10, let's just call it 10 years old. So after seven years, like it begins to hit the principal payment pretty significantly. So th this principal payment, it's probably got to pay down, you know, it's probably got a PE pay down of, let's just say 500 bucks a month. It's probably, I don't know, 250 per month, maybe. I'd be a little high, 250, 300 bucks per month. This right here, it's probably like 20 bucks a month for like the first seven years. So every year you're going to gain, what is that, 3K in note equity? So over the course of 10 years, you'll have 30K extra in equity. So I'll probably be at 78 grand in 10 years if they were to cash that out. And then this is probably, you know, I don't really know. It's not growing to too much, but you could compare them on an amortization calculator. And then the cool thing is in 10 more years, right, this one's free and clear at that point. And then they still got 10 years left to pay you right this awesome. is where okay. you get this is where it gets really cool man like if you know how to like trade notes you know how to do futures or fronts or backs or partials or whatnot like you can bring these values like you can bring that 48k forward immediately if you need it to okay and the calculator you mentioned earlier can you put that in the chat or something yeah it's right you, here you man. like tv yeah 10 bii See this right 10 BII. Oh, okay. Yep, 10 BII financial calculator. I think it's like six bucks. I, I buy it on my Mac and you know, for my apprentices. So I can like always show everybody like how we do it. Because here, I'll I'll just I'll show you. So let's say, so we'll, we'll do this one right here. So you got 145 grand. So that's your present value. Your IYR is your interest rate. 360 is your number of payments. And then you solve for payment. So 1273. Uh, I, I don't think that shows up on the screen share. Oh, it doesn't? It's, it's only showing your, your note section. So. Let's try this one. There you go. You see it now? Yeah, it's on there now. All right, sweet. So you got 145 grand, which is your present value of the existing mortgage. Your interest rate is 10. 360 months is in. So that's number of months paid. So 360 month mortgage. And then you solve for payment. The 1272. Yep. We did it right. <laughs> yeah. So it's called, it's called a 10 BI calculator. There's a phenomenal book guys. It's called invest in debt. It's like, it's tiny. It's a red book. It's probably like 50 or 60 bucks, um, but it's fantastic. It really will teach you how to use this calculator and, Another amazing one is called Tin Can Alley. These are super old books, but again, these just the understanding of like how to be creative is like if you sit down on the couch with a motivated seller and like, I don't buy that house, something's extremely wrong. Like if we go in an appointment and that house can be bought, we'll probably buy it. Yeah. Does that kind of help, man? Did I explain, did I answer your question on like the, the principal pay down and stuff? Yeah, that's great. I appreciate that. That's that's all good. Yeah. Wonderful. Anyone else? Okay. I uh, I know someone was raising the hand earlier, but I don't see them here right now. So I think they jumped. All right. Anyone else? You can raise the hand. You can ask the chat question. And I think Travis. Looks like somebody asked, "What note servicer do I use?" I use Madison uh, Note Servicing. I think they're in Nevada, Utah. Okay, there's that answer. Oral guys, uh, Travis, you already shared so many nuggets here that, well, this is a value to everyone, I think. It's also, I learned a lot on this call. So obviously you showed me the other side of the fence and Adrian here working with, with 
quite a lot of our super users also doesn't have answers to to these questions from this perspective for everyone because well obviously this is this is not something that we look at from from the real estate perspective only but we put accent on, on sms engagement however this conversation with, with someone as passionate about what they do as as travis and the way we just dove into this uh dove into this session and the way we kind of brainstormed it it was it was a very natural flow it was a great energy and and i'm just loving how spontaneous travis is about all this travis the question for you is do you buy in new york hell i don't know um no i haven't <laughs> i haven't all right that's a question from rudy here rudy where where do you buy? Right. I got notes all over the United States, but I don't I don't think I have any in New York. Anyone anyone else in the okay? I want to show text? I want to show another. Do you care if I do one more example, Catherine? Sure. No, no, no. Okay, cool. That would be great. I, I want to share I want to share this one because just like this is, I think this will be kind of a, a, a neat thing for everybody to know. And so a lot of them probably do, but like again, just in case guys don't. So guys, this is a this is a duplex that I bought. Uh, say, okay, so it was in Greenwood, South Carolina. I always like showing this because a lot of my seller finance deals are 0% interest. M most of them are 0% interest. So we always kind of try to structure it this way to where it's completely principal pay down every, every single month our payments are. And so if I don't buy a sub two and I buy a seller financed, I try to get it at 0% interest. And I'm going to show you like how we do that. And oddly, it tends to work like extremely often. Okay, so let's see here. Let me show you guys something. So this is a duplex. I bought it for 50 grand. I had to give him 7,500 down, the rest of it's uh, seller financed. And so, and it's 500 bucks per month until paid in full. Okay, so like most of the time, like whenever I tell people, they'll be like, what question? You know, how do you, uh, how do you do that? Like everybody always wants an interest rate, this and that. Most people are always going to want an interest rate. We never bring it up, but usually they're sophisticated enough or by the time they run it by an attorney or a friend or everybody's got a friend who's a real estate agent. And so there'll always be like some type of comebacks. And so this guy wanted um, this guy wanted 10 percent interest on the entire loan. So the original. Let's see if we can draw on this thing. The original agreement was he wanted 45 grand at 10% interest. And so what we always tell them, like whenever somebody tells me that, we just immediately respond. I'm like, awesome. Well, let's just we'll, we'll let's just put the 10% on the back of the loan. So I'll just add 10% to the loan and then we'll just still pay you 500 bucks per month. Cool. And usually whenever we kind of do that on the spot, we can get the agreement we want. And so again, it's just about being like an understanding, like knowing how to pivot and go, you know, and just move this stuff along like effectively. And so what I did, guys, was I just made this deal 50 grand at 500 per month till paid in full. So, and if you understand, like, if you ran amortization calculators on that and looked at that, this is not even remotely the same deal at all. It's not even close. I would have paid, who knows, probably 100 grand on that $45,000 one. But instead, this thing will be paid for in six months. And so, and today, this, I did have to put 20K into rehab this one, but it rents. Um, I don't know, it's 950 aside, whatever that is. So 1900 a month uh, total on the duplex. But that's not really important. The important part is like whenever somebody tells you that they want interest, we always kind of try to go back to them and say, great, well, let's just add it onto the loan. And so if they want 10%, I just put 10% onto the loan. I wish that's how banks would do it too, but we all know they don't. Buy a $200,000 home, you're going to pay like seven or 800 for it. So that was my la that was my last thing. I have another example of like a lease option that I can go into if we need to, but I think like I think everybody hopefully has kind of got a few things out of this. Travis, this was beautiful, and Ken, glad to see you in another event. Travis, thank you so much for for sharing all this, guys. Open space for Q and A. Uh, obviously, Travis laid out a lot already. Uh, if there's any details that you want, you can ask now. Again, we're going to have wonderful Ken. Thanks. Uh, you're you're definitely going to have a chance to do that in about some ten minutes, right, Travis? So Travis is going to be kicking off yeah. another Zoom right after this one. So 
basically you guys can ask any additional questions there as well. Uh, that's also a networking opportunity for everyone. Uh, also, we want to share our, our Lodge Creative, Creative Financing link. So this is where you can check that out. And obviously just hearing from Travis here today tells you how much value can be can be found right there. This is also Travis's contact info that, that he wanted to share with everyone. And here is the phone number where you can reach him. So let's see if, uh, okay, I think I see someone that had a question before and raised hand then jumped off. It says the team. So sorry, not, not really sure about the name. Hi. Oh, that's me. I have a question. Oh, okay. That's Michael. That's you. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Sorry, guys. This is my boss, um, our CCO, <laughs> Michael Bartolome. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. Hey, Travis. Hey, how are you? What's up, dude? Hey, man. Um, all right. So I have, a, I have an easy question for you. But first, I just wanted to say, guys, uh, I'm sure you can hear it just in Travis's voice and the way that he presents. Uh, there's literally not a person that I trust in the REI investment space more than I trust Travis. This kind of just transparent, clear really hyper detailed explanations of exactly what you're going to get, how, what the outcomes are going to be. That's it's why I trust him because that's what he does is he's just super honest, upfront and clear about everything. So if you have the opportunity to work with him, do like everybody I know that's gone through his, his program that's worked with him directly has come out on the other side, obviously a lot wealthier, but also just, it's, it's a really good educational experience. So I, I cannot recommend what Travis does highly enough. Travis, my question for you. Thanks, man. I mean, dude, you're making enough money doing this. Are you selling people furniture too? Like what's going on in that wood shop? <laughs> Maybe, man. Maybe I'll have an Airbnb wood shop too. No, there dude, you go. this is actually, it's kind of, it's kind of cool, man. So this is, we moved in here probably about six months ago. This is my grandparents' place. So I live in Southern Illinois, guys. So I do everything 100% virtually. Like we don't go to a home until it's under contract. And so my team's in Georgia and South Carolina, but I teach everything uh, to where it's, you can do it in person, you can do virtual. It's entirely your choice, but it's kind of cool. This, my grandpa died 12 years ago and like he, hung, this is his shed and he hung these tools up and everything. And I just, I haven't moved them. And so I've left them up uh, ever since. So I just thought it was really cool. You know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to touch them. They're going to be here for as long as I am. So, and it's about 500 yards from my house. So like my kids, it takes them a little bit to get here. So <laughs> thanks for asking, dude. That's a, that's a cool question. Yeah, I love it. And it fits my personality, man. I'm just a country dude from Southern Illinois. I like to hunt and fish and real estate just kind of lets me do more of that. My kids don't, but everything else does. <laughs> actually the, this woodshed place is, is the first thing i learned about travis and he just laid out the story when when adrian and i first met him he was he was a part of launch family for for a long time before adrian and i actually got in touch and got to to do some some work together um uh, so it was it was really amazing to to see his personality besides the way how he does business so we we definitely treat travis as as a friend around here Guys, this is uh, I guess Thanks. this is the time to to call this session closed, I guess. But before that, um, actually, gonna... Catherine, one last thing, and then I'll I'll let you close it out. Sorry sure, to interrupt, sure. um, guys. Just so you know that uh, the reason why we we brought Travis on today, other than the fact that you know everything I just said, that like he's one of the best, is that we've been hearing a lot of chatter about people wanting to really get into the subject two side of things and having some confusion around how to get that started and what some of the challenges are, et cetera. And so we, we put this together to kind of answer those questions for you guys. And, you know, Travis is, as you can tell, the best possible resource that we could bring on. But, you know, moving forward, speak up about any of those things that, that you want to, to really learn more about and hear more about, because we, we are very much tapped into the real estate investment community and, and have some great connections like Travis uh, in different areas. So, you know, you guys can kind of help guide the, the future of this mastermind series by, by just doing just that. Like, let us know where we can help educate and we'll, be, we'll bring in people uh, like Travis to really help um, move you guys forward in your businesses. Okay. That's cool, man. That's cool. You to do that. 
Beautiful. Okay. Well, everyone, this was Launch Control Success Mastermind, Volume 4. There is going to be another event in a month from now, of course, and that's probably going to be us and Callan Faulkner talking about land deals. And Callan is also one of our affiliates. She does coaching as well. I guess some of you are already familiar with, with her, if, if not all. Adrian, thank you. Thank you so much on co-piloting this event with me. Travis, it was beautiful connecting with you working in this session. And I think it was it was definitely a value for everyone. So we appreciate yeah, you thank all. you. Catherine, will you drop the Zoom link in there for everybody in case somebody wants to jump in there? I'm gonna I'm gonna go. Sure, I did it at the beginning of the call, but let me just repeat it because there was a lot said. I love the conversation. Yeah. Well, I figured some guys might have deeper questions on certain things and some maybe some more insurance stuff. And I was just gonna show my real show my actual documentation on it. All right, here it is. And thank you, Sahil. So obviously, Sahil, I'll see you in June then at the next mastermind. Travis. Here's the, the Zoom link laid out for everyone. Everyone feel free to, to join the call if, if you want to join Travis's tribe or just overall have a chat with him. Uh, you saw how much value he can share within an hour. Uh, thank you for participating. It was lovely and uh, I'll see you soon again. See you guys. Bye. Bye, -bye. All. See you. Bye, everyone.